And then just to remind everybody again on the Dame Emir conference, that's free for any Dame Emir chapter member. So if if you are keen to attend and uh, you need to be a Dame South Africa member. So give us a call, give us a shout. I know I've had a few people, a few people from Saudi wanting to join Dame South Africa. Um, we'll, but we'll just call it Dame Essa and we'll be there together. Dame Saudi Arabia and Dame South Africa. Um, all right, so these were some of the, the people that attended and spoke. Um, we need to get all those speakers registered as well. So anyone who's interested in speaking, um, people like Esti and Paul and anybody there that's that's keen to present, that's on the 1st of December. Um, and then we'll get back to the important one. That's, this is the series that we've been doing. Um, I know I've enjoyed it. I know I've learned a lot working with Don in terms of understanding time series and economic data and, and elements like that. Um, and it's fascinating. It's a fascinating world, especially as professionals. We need to understand the business so that we can build the infrastructure, we can build the storage, we can build the data models. And as Don, and it was really a revelation for me last week in terms of how much we need to understand about the business and how it works, what's important, uh, the judgments, the versions and all those different elements. And this is how we get to understand the business and, and support the business. And today, Don will be talking about the data executive. And I know we've had some chats in between just in terms of valuing data. I think this is a crucial element for us as well. And I really look forward to it. I, I can tell you it's not an easy job. But um, let me not say too much more before Don takes over. Don, all yours. Excellent. Thank you, Howard. Sorry, now everything else has disappeared. There we go. Fantastic. Uh, excellent. So as Howard said, um, this is um, the final presentation in the series of four. Today we're going to talk about data executives. Um, and uh, I just we've got Byron and Rousseau with me as well. They they put uh, some of the content uh, together as well for this presentation. Um, and I look forward to the discussion um, at the end. Um, so um, today's session is really going to wrap things up. So it's going to draw on um, the content that we've presented to date, but it's going to also think about the value proposition for econ data um, from the perspective of a data executive. Um, and I think hopefully this will be interesting to a data science and data management audience um, to give you a little bit more insight into how um, uh, time series economic data or the challenges involved in creating analytics out of um, time series economic data um, and uh, creating value out of uh, out of the underlying data. Now, what is a data executive? Um, there are lots of definitions, um, and these include, um, or, or they've been, particularly in recent years, many new executive positions that have been created um, for uh, for executives that um, are tasked with um, creating revenue from data or um, optimizing business processes um, or producing new insights for decisions. Um, so in these types of positions are chief uh, data op, uh, officer, chief analytics officer and the like. Um, so that's uh, that's the perspective that we'll be taking today. Now I've stolen one of Howard's charts, um, but uh, I put a slightly different spin on it. So um, he's presented these, the, the value proposition um, about how to get from data to decisions uh, using this triangle with the base um, being um, data, so raw data from lots of different sources, um, and the requirement that that data be cleaned and processed in a way that it can be made sense of. Sitting on top of that is uh, is information, so the um, it's really important to present data in a way that can be understood. So, for example, presenting data in a table or a graphical format. Um, to provide some context about what the data means. But really, as we move up the triangle, the data becomes more useful and valuable. As you um, as you get to the, the intelligence layer, it's all about how to add business context to the information. So 
adding an analytics um, and interpretation. So for example, uh, looking at what the underlying trends of the data is, um, reviewing evidence um, and the like. And then um, at the top, we have um, decisions. So it's all about understanding the business, answering questions that, um, that relate to things like, um, what are the trade-offs in a decision, being able to measure them, being able to um, present um, what the what emerging data mean for the business and what should be done. So you can think of, uh, oh, so apologies. Um, you can think of how the, um, of the, of the role of the data, um, the data scientist as being forward looking, so producing predictions and the role of uh, BI um, focusing on historical data, for example. Now, we've talked about the data value chain um, a lot, and it, uh, uh, from our perspective, a lot, most of the value sits at, right at the end of the value chain. Um, so it's about what kind of questions can you answer and what does a decision maker need to do to make something happen? But to get to the end of the value chain, you need to have the right infrastructure and tooling to be able to get there. Um, and so you need to be able to produce things like descriptive statistics that describe what has happened. Um, you need diagnostic analytics that describe why did something happen? And you need um, predictive analytics that help you understand what will or what might happen. And then at the end of the value chain, it's all about um, how can we make something happen? So it's a, it's um, a lot of advanced people who do advanced analytics get stuck in, at this point and they forget to tie the analytics that they produce back to what decision makers care about. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, I've stolen another one of uh, Howard's charts. Um, but I think it's it's a useful um, uh, it's a useful depiction of how important it is to provide a clear line of sight from data to value. Um, so one of the things that is really difficult in a large institution and where um, data scientists often uh, uh, get things wrong from the decision maker's perspective is to start just with the data. Um, and how to manage the data and, and aggregate it all um, and forget about what ultimately is the value that the, the their clients internally or externally um, want to get out of the data. And that's completely understandable because uh, um, from a data management perspective, a data engineering perspective, the um, you want to be able to enable lots of different use cases um, and you don't know what those might be. But the challenge with that is that if you don't um, know what uh, you ultimately want to get out of the data, um, it's really difficult to think strategically about what data you need, about what use cases to prioritize in order to achieve the organization's goals. And so the way that we in Codera work is we start at the end, we just, we, we, we start with what the KPIs are. Um, and then we work backwards to enable um, answering specific questions and creating infrastructure that enables the answering of, of, of specific questions. So, uh, just another. I... Yes, Howard. <clears throat> Can I just ask a question on on? Um, I, I like what you're saying there in terms of the KPIs and, and working backwards. I think we, we're all in agreement with that. Um, the one thing that I've battled with so often is having an understanding of what those those decisions and KPIs are. So almost like having an inventory of all of those decisions that need to be made. And I was wondering if if you if you have these type of decisions well defined um, from an economic point of view, are they are they pretty consistent in terms of uh, all the banks, the financial services, um, 
and and just having a list of those because it's it's nice to say okay these are the decisions we need to make what are they and how does the data support those decisions which is which is fantastic if you've got that i think my next slide helps uh, answer that question um so i i think the context really matters so in the context of a bank um the kpis will be completely different uh and and the kpis again will be different if you are focusing on creating data products or if you're versus if you're trying to uh, uh if you're trying to do something else like um so it depends a little bit on on on, on what the strategic priorities are for the type of business that you're in and the industry that you're in so i think this context really matters and i think the but i think it leads into to to this because what you really care about is um what are the kind of questions that you need to answer how will those kpis address those questions um and it's about strategic alignment of those kpis ultimately for that kind of business so there's there is certainly an, an industry overlay but there's there's very much also a, you need to under you have to have good enough domain understanding of what the business wants um so that you can align these with their strategic objectives and these might be backward looking and they may be forward looking um right. and so uh, a register of these is uh, as many institutions have registers of these but um i think uh, maybe i should start with a tangible example so uh, we come from a, a central banking background um, and the kind of question that you'd be that you as an a, as a analyst might be uh, tasked with answering is something like what is driving inflation is that is that likely to be is the increase in inflation like in the current context likely to be permanent is it likely to be transitory um, and then what should the central bank or the government do so that's an example of uh, an analytical challenge that meets a KPI, which is in this case, the organization's main objective, which is to, to achieve um, price stability uh, in a forward looking sense. So um, it's all about being able to produce answers to questions and then tie them back to what the uh, decision maker ultimately cares about. And I'm gonna give you a couple of tangible examples in a, in a more general business setting shortly. I think uh, I've covered a little bit of this already. I think I'd like to focus on this as well, um, which is about um, really once you have communicated the analytical implications, um, depending on um, the success or failure of 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 your ability to answer that question and convince decision makers, what's really crucial is to then use it as an opportunity to improve the way that you communicate, or it's perhaps an opportunity to improve the underlying infrastructure or processes that have helped you generate the analytics. And I'm going to show you a couple of ways that we do that in Codera in an economic context. So, uh, keeps disappearing, here we go. So I think a really good example of, uh, of what I mean by uh, actionable insights or by, um, data ready decision or uh, going from data to decisions is uh, a consumer data example. So a lot of uh, data scientists get stuck uh, halfway through the process. So they collect in the case of uh, say uh, a bank or a, an institution that has consumer data, um, collect the data, put it in a form that's ready to be used, uh, perform some advanced analytics and produce forecasts. Um, and many uh, people get stuck at this stage thinking that this is the this is ultimately what it's about. It's about pro producing a good prediction of something. But really what the decision maker cares about is how does it solve their problems? So and how does it enhance um, their decision making? How does it en enable the business to achieve its strategic objectives? So uh, in this case, it's about how do those predictions help you provide product recommendations to your clients that actually increase real revenue. Um, for fraud detection purposes, you know, can can the models help you um, identify outliers? Um, and can it help you optimize your marketing? A really nice example that I've saw from uh, McKinsey um, 
was uh, about Amazon and how their prediction algorithms um, enhance uh, their recommendations. Uh, so in, I think in their case in 2017, um, they were able to um, tie something like 35% of, of purchases back to the company's recommendation system. And in that way, because you can measure the outcome that's been achieved from the model, you can you can actually assess the value add that you're getting from the analytics um, and do that on an ongoing basis. Um, that is the way ultimately that you convince um, executives uh, of the value of not just the underlying data, but also the data combined with the analytics. Now, before I we get more tangible, I'm going to, I just want to give you a, an overview summary of the various different benefits um, of data-driven decision-making. Uh, in our case, we focus on analyzing macroeconomic and um, industry and market data and trying to synthesize what the implications are for our clients or um, their clients. Um, and we try and use advanced analytic frameworks, so you know, leading edge um, frameworks to do that. Uh, so it's about um, thinking ultimately about what the client cares about. Um, and here is a list of, uh, here's a collection of different examples. And really, um, again, in an economic data context, it's about um, being able to uh, produce insights about what the data the, the data means about the, the current context. It's about being able to predict the future. It's about being able to give a decision maker confidence that those predictions are good if, or um, enable them to measure how much confidence they should be putting in a specific uh, prediction. Being able to, especially in a real time context, enable uh, questions to be answered using the same framework. And we're going to show you a couple of examples of how we do that. And in another aspect that's really important in an economic concept uh, context is being able to measure and characterize uh, the nature of risk um, and communicate that to um, a decision maker so that they can understand um, the trade-offs of actions. Then, um, we're going to show you a couple of examples of how powerful visualization of um, data and complex models um, can be can help you communicate more effectively. Um, and I'm going to show you how tangibly you can measure um, the cost reductions from process automation, um, as well as things like um, measuring um, the revenue benefits of um, of this kind of way of work that we've described over the course of this series. So there are two main. Sorry. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Howard. Just hopefully, the, I, I like that last slide of yours and the, and the one before. And I am assuming that you you will close the loop by making the decision, recording what the decision was and then uh, and the action and then assessing the the outcomes. Exactly. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how in an economic context um, you need to differentiate between what the data is telling you, what the model is telling you, um, what the judgments are that you are overlaying over a model, and then and I, and then ultimately assess um, whether you've been getting your decisions right on based on the metric that you care about. Um, and accuracy of a forecast is an example of that. Um, and I'm going to show you how you can distinguish between those components, for example. Okay. And then there was just a question or a comment from Esti, and, uh, and I'm I'm sure you've got that. And I know that uh, I saw you guys using this in in the Reserve Bank of uh, using leading and lagging indicators. So as you're detecting what's happening, it's of, it's a showing you the future of what's going to happen. Are, are you in a way um, recording that in terms of what these different indicators are showing you? 
absolutely. So I think it, it fits in here um, that, uh, and I was going to show you, well, uh, I've shown some examples, I think, in some of the previous presentations of how you can assess uh, and, and some of our other work of how you can assess the contribution of different indicators to forecast performance of a model. So it's not, it's, uh, it's really about once you know what the problem is that you're trying to answer, um, looking at what is the kind of data that you need, looking at what are the kind of indicators that need to, you need to create to summarize that data. And then you want to assess on an ongoing basis. Um, what is the, what is the usefulness of those underlying indicators to to tell you about what other what is going on or, or to help you forecast the future? Um, and ideally, you want to do that in a dynamic uh, way. So I think a, a lot of uh, data scientists build a model and then the model um, is is only re-estimated uh, infrequently and its perfor performances are, is not assessed regularly. And I think usually it's just one model is developed for a certain purpose. And um, what we what we always try and do in, in Codera is use a variety of different frameworks um, and then assess their relative performance in, um, on an ongoing basis so that you can put more weight on what one model is telling you. And it also gives you a signal if one model's relative performance is weakening that um, you may want to re-estimate that model, or you, or maybe there's something structurally happening in the economy. There's something changing, um, and that helps you actually tell a story about what is going on, and helps you identify um, uh, other questions to dig into. Okay. In the one example that I had, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure I can share that. But in in the central bank where we worked, there was uh, some relationship drawn between the foreign exchange rate and the balance of payments. So one indicator was leading another. Um, and, and so there's these relationships in this taxonomy of these economic concepts. And I'm assuming you're handling that that sort of thing as well within these different models. Exactly. Rousseau can tell you a lot more about this, um, about how um, the relationships between variables um, change over time in an economic context. So it's not like engineering where there's, um, you know, a, a power law that uh, or a, a natural relationship between two different um, be between inputs and outputs, for example, in economics, these relationships um, are often time varying. And so you need models. So some models that don't take that into account will perform differently over time and some models can actually account for that, and um, you know, and as a result, um, will naturally take into account um, changes in the in the relationships, but also the structure of the economy. Thank you. So, just a little bit more about the the value proposition and from of econ data and and the way of work we've described over the course of this series. Um, from the context, from the perspective of a data executive, there are really two that I'd like to focus on, and that's that econ data enables the data management, uh, enables data management of economic data for automation um, and modeling. So, uh, you, and it does it in a way that um, is uh, not only scalable. But also the data management, because the uh, information model is based on SDMX, as we've discussed in as we discussed in the first um, and second um, of these uh, of the series, um, because it's based on an um, uh, information model that is evolving over time, based on statistical best practice, um, it means that it will also continue to um, evolve in a way that enables. Um, the management of um, new types of data um, and, and and over time more enable more and more um, features to be added to to to, to the data product um, and importantly the way that e econ data operates it operates like an umbrella it enables you to map data from different data management systems or different data sources into um, 
in, into the platform and so enables you to really quickly and uh, uh, and affordably compared to to uh, other ways of work um, centralized data from a variety of different data sources in a way that economic data is available for advanced analytics and so i'm also going to show you that some of the tools that we can layer on top of it um, enable you to very quickly um, uh, access data um, with with a variety of different uh, tools and applications um, and you can layer uh, models on top of it that enable you to um, interact with with models um, visually communicate uh, insights from models um, assess uh, their their quality in the dimension that matters for um, the issue at hand and uh, tie back the analytics to what the decision maker ultimately cares about. I'm going to show you a couple of practical examples in a, in a couple of moments. But first, I want to give you an example um, drawing on our probabilistic banking forecasting model, just to give you a, an overview. Um, now, our um, we needed to create econ data to enable us to be able to automate models that use South African economic data. Um, and because of the way that we've that we use our models, we integrate uh, the data into the into our data products, and it enables us to automate the data from um, from source, so that a user is able to when they use the model, they're always they always have the latest data available to them. So they don't have to go through any manual process to update the data. And um, as I showed you in the first couple of presentations of the series, that this has a, many benefits in terms of uh, process control, process automation, um, and data governance. And as I'm going to show you shortly, um, econ data, um, which, is, which so is the source for the data that we use, um, enables a user to look through the data glossary, see what data is available, um, and enables actual measurement of uh, the value that uh, users get from um, using uh, the platform and the models that run off it. One of the key focuses for us is being able to marry um, aggregate and disaggregate uh, trends and uh, model results. So um, in the case of the banking model, you can look at individual banks or you can look at the the banking industry um, and uh, understand um, whether there are differences at individual bank level compared to um, in aggregate. And I'm going to show you how we visualize model results and the insights we glean from them, uh, as well as we, uh, how we can allow users to um, do scenario analysis, uh, add judgments, um, and answer questions in real time using the model, drawing on the, the latest data that's available. And then lastly, the ability to actually monitor the value that you're getting um, from this, from the model or from the underlying platform by being able to monitor usage, accurately assess um, accuracy on an ongoing basis, and actually um, tangibly measure the benefit that you're getting from um, a specific framework. Now uh, here's uh, just a summary of the framework that Howard has presented on in the past um, in terms of thinking about how to value uh, data and uh, specific use cases. In this case, we're looking at econ data, the, the data platform. And um, the, the framework focuses on defining different value dimensions as well as value metric groups and then thinking about tangibly measuring metrics. Here I'm just showing you a, a list and then I'm going to next show you a couple of um, sp you know, specific examples about how to value the monetary value um, of each of these concepts. Um, so the value dimension by way of example, um, you, you could be things like usage, um, the ability to assess data quality, and also to think about data costs and value. Um, in the case of econ data, because we um, use user profiles, it's possible for us not just to control access uh, based on 
a user's role to specific series, but we can also measure um, their activity um, and so give feedback on the types of data that are most regularly used um, and, and an individual's activity um, to measure the amount of activity and the amount of value that someone's getting. We can also think about things like um, how trustworthy the data is and measuring that explicitly um, using the platform. We can think about uh, the, the platform enables the ability to do quality checks on the data um, and to assess um, uh, to, to assess whether the, the data is reliable. So is it accessible? Is it searchable? Is it understandable? Um, and um, as we've shown in the previous um, presentations, the user can interact with data in a way that allows them immediately to assess that. Um, we can also think about the economic costs and value associated with econ data. So um, in terms of the, the ability to, uh, to save time for users because it centralizes uh, economic data in one place, um, structuring the data in a way that's ready for analytics, um, avoiding the necessity for someone else to go and do the same thing. Um, it um, also makes us available um, very affordably compared to um, other services um, that do this. Um, and you can also um, measure how many people are subscribing to the service to, to actually um, value the product. I wanted also just to show you a summary of um, how we have thought about uh, the use case for econ data. So starting with all of the challenges that that we faced um, and how the platform enables us um, to not only solve those problems individually, but when taken together, um, the platform solves a range of different data management uh, challenges. It solves a number of um, challenges that data professionals face in trying to produce insights out of the, the out of data, um, and it also enables a value creation um, that wouldn't have been possible without its existence. Um, so, in a sense, this slide summarizes really the whole series and uh, the value propositions that we presented um, from each of the to each of the other person data personas. Um, and uh, and we've talked about these a lot, but I think it, perhaps in the, the Q&A at the end, we can actually dig into some of this because I think um, there, as I said in the last presentation, econ data um, on the one hand makes some tasks substantially easier, um, but it also means that some things that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have been possible in the South African context are now feasible. Um, and so, not only are there cost reductions um, that are achievable by using um, econ data or a related that related way of work, but you can also actually gain a lot of um, benefits that would not have been um, in reach um, without uh, econ data and the way of the associated way of work that I'm going to be demonstrating. So I'd like to zoom in on an example of how to think about valuing um, uh, in our case, the econ data platform as a use case. Um, this is drawing on Howard's framework for um, for thinking about how to prioritize use cases by tangibly measuring um, the the achievement of different goals across a variety of different dimensions. Um, and then boiling all of that down into something that an executive um, can use to prioritize. So being, for example, being able to assess the rate of uh, return um, on a specific, um, to a specific use case. Now in our case, um, as I've alluded to, some of the main benefits of using econ data relate to cost reduction. So um, for example, uh, we host, about 80,000 uh, series on the platform. And if you had to manually update all of those time series, 
it would be a full time job for someone. And I think that's conservative because um, the amount of data that it hosts is substantially larger than many departments in large institutions. Um, and so, you know, this is really a, a lower bound by you know, assuming, for example, that it, this is the salary of, of one data, uh, data steward, for example, um, who'd be responsible for, for updating. Um, as I've said, there are alternative platforms that charge substantial um, amounts uh, for access to public domain data, something that um, Econ Data um, does um, very cheaply. Then, um, and you can compare the costs um, of what of the product compared to alternatives. So then another one that's really important um, is the ability to automate models that is not possible without a tool like EconData, because EconData puts the data in a form that um, you can uh, you can ensure that the, the data is always up to date so that the model always draws the, the most um, up to date data and enables you to actually assess um, the uh, the performance of models in real time by comparing because you have access to all of the vintages of data so you can compare real time performance of models um, and push judgments that have been imposed on models back into the system. So there's uh, really useful auditing functions as well. This done manually um, would involve a lot of effort for an econometrician. And again, I think in large institutions, you have big teams that are responsible for the kinds of activities um, relating to the updating of models and frameworks. And um, here, so again, I think this is really a lower bound, assuming you know you had one um, well remunerated econometrician um, responsible for model updating. So this is an example just of cost reduction. So really, that's one line item in the framework that Howard's presented in his um, presentations. Um, but you can then uh, stack the different uh, value measures on top of each other. And um, I'd really recommend looking at um, at his at his content because it makes it really easy for you to then once you have valued um, the costs and the benefits um, of the different value metrics that apply in your use case, you can then uh, create a register of different use cases, um, which enables you to to um, to prioritize um, and and at least debate. Um, which use cases uh, should be pursued. But as Howard's already said, this is uh, as much of an art as it is a science. Um, and it really, uh, it is really difficult for some types of data products. Um, and it's something that you need to review over time as you get more experience of a specific industry or understand uh, the value proposition um, of a specific use case better. Um, a framework that Howard's also pointed to um, that I think is really useful in this regard is Douglas Laney's uh, framework, um, which I think uh, you know is a really useful. Um, also contextualizes this and makes it really practical um, in other for other types of uh, data disciplines. I have put that um, framework, Doug's framework, in the chat, Don. Um, so th that one was. A lot more complex than than what we suggested is where it's just business value, which is the ROI compared to the implementation feasibility from a technical point of view. Doug Laney does extend that, but it's it's it's. I think both of you, you and I, have realised that it's hard to translate numbers into business impact. Um, you know, to say, well, what does this mean, and how do we share all of it, and, and things like that. And as important as this is, I think um, I'm I'm hoping that as I'm going to start showing you pictures, you'll realize that the value is almost self-evident um, to some of the frameworks that I'm going to show you. Um, and so while it's really important from a executive's perspective to have the ability to compare because of the all of the competing um, demands and resource and, and, and acknowledging resource constraints. At the same time, I'm going to show you that this way of work that we use enables uh, enables uh, 
it makes it very tangible to a decision maker that uh, the analytics will matter. Um, and so it also helps that subjective assessment that that is the ultimately the overlay if you have to make you know, ordinal decisions about um, whether you know, which types of problems should be solved first, for example. I'd like to zoom in on you know one specific example. Now, in the past, I've shown you how um, you can use econ data. You can access data from econ data using uh, in different data formats, and you can use um, um, any. You can use a scripting language to access um, data programmatically. But I wanted to show you how um, the the uh, the Excel plugin that Byron's developed that enables a user to um, to update Excel spreadsheets um, using econ data. Now, this means that a user can use whatever application they want to access and update data. And so for data professionals, this means that you are um, you are not requiring the user to necessarily change their way of work, um, but you're also enabling them to, because you're enabling automation and programmatic access, you're enabling them to, to become hyper productive, but people can still um, use the old way of work if they wish to. And so as a result, this change would, isn't as threatening as it would otherwise be. Um, and um, but while you can also show the upside of, of, of um, doing things differently. I also wanted to show you the, the power of um, auto updated dashboards. Now, um, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen these before, and I think you know ours is really just a, again a, a proof of concept. But it's really valuable if dashboards are not just auto updated, but they're interactive. So if a user is able to select certain aggregations, this is automatically you know fed into the charts, and the charts change dynamically. Uh, users are able to click on the charts, drag them around, zoom in. Um, you know, look at a specific data point, uh, an outlier, for example, and then they're able to save the picture that they've created this way. So it creates different ways of interacting with data, um, and it enables you to to talk as a as a team or when you're speaking to an executive in a boardroom situation to be able to quickly point to the data and answer specific questions if there are ones about the underlying data without you know. And I'm going to show you next how you can do the same thing in a modeling context. Now, here's an example of, um, of really the value add that you ultimately get if you've created a data platform like Econ Data. Now, you can always have the up-to-date data available. And in this case, we've just got a simple um, you know, web-based web -based application that enables you to pick a variable, in this case, non-performing loans for banks, um, create it, use best uh, the best possible model to produce a forecast in this case the forecast shows um, the probability distribution around the forecast so it shows you that there's some um, there's a there's downward uh, downward expectation on for net non-performing loans as at that time um, and you can see you know the risk profile around that specific forecast and you can do this a user can select a different variable and produce a different forecast um, in economics in particular uh, judgment is often overlaid over the statistical forecast from uh, a model um, so for example if you work at a mining company um, you may have a specific view over where the coal price is going to go. So you may want to um, create an, um, a specific judgment about where, what that forecast profile looks like, but you'd, you'd have a model that um, has many other variables and you will want to be able to um, impose that judgment on the model. Here, what we've done is we've got non-performing loans for banks um, and the statistical model produces a baseline forecast then an analyst has added judgment to the model, and you can look see what the difference is between the the statistical mod forecast and then the judgment-based forecast. And you can assess 
their statistical performance um, over time. And you, you can ask, how well does the model fit the data? How well does the uh, forecast, how accurate are the forecasts in real time? Um, how well, for example, does the model um, forecast whether the variable is going to go up or down? Um, and you can store all of these judgments, push them back into econ data, and this allows you not just to have an audit trail of what judgments were applied. And so from a governance perspective is very important, but also is able to al allow you to um, learn from your mistakes by, by, by seeing whether your judgments are improving forecasts or not. Um, and then incorporating that into your way of thinking and your decision making process. But this is especially powerful if you're able to dynamically answer questions in a boardroom context. So say a forecast goes to a boardroom, um, the, uh, the decision makers are able to, to, make, to add judgments to the different components of a model dynamically and then see what that actually means for the forecast. And if you have a, a complex model, then you can tie it back to the um, the concept that the decision maker cares about. Um, and I've given a couple of examples earlier in the presentation on, on, on how that would work. So here you can see, for example, that the original forecast is just for a flat line for the variable. Um, and you can see that you're able um, to apply judgments to change that. And the model, you just click on save the scenario and the model will update. So just to summarize, um, again, um, we've presented this framework um, many times for the um, other um, data personas. And what this is about is um, what does the, um, why, should a, why should a data executive uh, be motivated to use econ data? Um, what do they need to do or know? Um, when do they, where do they need to use it? When do they need to use it? Um, uh, who and who would use it and how would it be used? Um, and I think this does tie um, all of the different, the other presentations together. Um, that from the perspective of a data executive, the value of econ data is that it enables an, an institution or a company to realize value from their data, um, to understand um, and measure what the insights are that they're getting from, from the data itself um, and from the models that um, are able to be automated because of the existence of econ data. And as I've described in the earlier presentations, the use of an SDMX information uh, model means that um, once um, you've mapped data from source to econ data, um, you actually are able to quickly and affordably centralize data, just the data that you need to be able to do advanced analytics. And so this um, solves the, a problem that many large institutions have where potentially hundreds of different legacy systems have to be uh, combined into a central data store something that becomes incredibly complex um, if you're trying to do it all in a bit in a big bang whereas um, you know econ data shows that this is possible by a small group of people very quickly and um, importantly this enables um, the type of model automation and sophisticated analysis of economic data that um, that really uh, decision makers need to be able to assess um, the advice that they are given and the trade-offs associated um, with the analytics that are tabled to them. Great, thanks Howard. Don, thank you very much. Um, that was that was amazing. Uh, I would certainly like to just thank you for all the effort that you've put in over the last four weeks. I know it's been helpful to me in terms of understanding how people can apply the data value realization and, and those frameworks to their own use cases. So I know we've got a 
couple of Saudis on the call, Ahmed, uh, that and they're going through that process right now. So this was great to see an application and it's nice to see you working on it. Um, I know it wasn't easy in terms of quantifying. I know, for example, we noticed that there is a cost reduction area that, uh, that, that you can talk to and it's the revenue generation one that people will get all excited about but of course we have to start in some cases with cost reduction um there is a question from esti um and basically she's asking about the judgments that you can save it and refer to it later and compare the judgments um i believe that is possible absolutely and this is really important um in many policy institutions where there is both a governance requirement to be able to do that um, and to be able to point to not just the judgments that were used to produce a forecast, but what was the actual underlying data that was used to run the model. Um, that's really important. So that's that's a feature that's missing in many data management systems that are used. Um, but it's also uh, for institutional culture around data use and modeling. It's also very valuable by creating transparency uh, and the ability to actually um, dynamically question where the judgments are appropriate, um, right. which is something that is generally um, hidden by econometricians when presenting to um, to executives. And it is actually something that um, uh, is is really important to the outcomes that um, ultimately executives care about. Thank you. Isti, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And I think it's so cool because otherwise it would depend on somebody manually adding additional documentation or doing write-ups on other reports or like a different like wiki or something to keep track of that. So I think this is very cool. Yeah. And I was, I mean, I must admit, I was blown away the first time I saw some of this stuff is when you look at the final graph that's presented and, and you can't actually discern between what was data and what was judgments. And then it's a case of, well, how do I get back to the original? And and then it's, uh, these adjustments are made here and here and that, that goes blind. So that transparency is lost. Um, so, so, and then Don, there's another question from Manj. Um, are you aware of comparable models for other sectors, e.g. healthcare, um, for JG, ESG, <laughs> any, any, any other application of this to, to other industries? Uh, really, uh, models can be applied to any kind of question. So the, uh, what we've tried to do, and Rousseau can, you know, Rousseau do come in if you have anything to add, um, is, is to basically build just the the infrastructure that enables us to enable these kinds of uh, um, these kinds of uh, questions to be answered. Now you could you you could build a different model in a for a specific industry, or you could build a um, uh, and we we wanted just to build a proof of concept to describe you know in a banking context because it's it's general and the data is is all in econ data, um, but. Really, this um, you you could you could apply deploy this kind of technology to any kind of modeling problem. So, for example, what I like is and, and JG could come in if if we were looking at at an impact, for example, on customer lifetime value, uh, and we're predicting what it's going to be in the next whatever period of time. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a GDP or customer lifetime value. If there's a trend and a forecast. You can apply the same thing and you may want to add judgments to that, which is something that I probably haven't recognized in the past is to say, oh, well, it's not just predicting, but it's also the judgment management around that. And Byron, do you have anything to add on on the use of judgment? I think I've only scratched the surface really. Yeah, I mean, without going into into too much detail, you know, you've the system is basically like an empirical foundation that you can you can build different models on top of so you can um, use what the variation in the data to give you an idea 
of how to build different scenarios and uh, and therefore or thereby uh, incorporate your judgments to you know allow for the thinking through different uh, different possible outcomes yeah and if i can just add something to the to the whole judgment um idea it's that it's it's obviously good for uh, just data management and auditing purposes and all of that but the one of the really important reasons why you want to track that is you want to give that feedback back to the person that's actually working with this tool or working on the analysis so that they can go back in time and see where are they applying judgment incorrectly or pushing variable forecasts in um, certain directions and that they sort of can confront their own biases that they that they might have um, in this process. That's, that's really powerful. Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I certainly agree. I, I love that about this in that, you know, there's so many, especially cognitive biases that apply. And if you can use those to make otherwise very tacit um, judgments, very transparent and be able to track it, it is invaluable. It's indisputable. I mean, what are they going to argue with you for? <laughs> it's yeah. in their face, right? Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, the other point I want to raise is that this can be potentially a very valuable tool for scenario planning training. Um, what do you think, John? Absolutely. So, you know, we've shown you two examples here of, of, of just uh, how judgments can be overlaid. Um, but Rousseau has been building a probabilistic framework um, that can be applied to different types of questions to enable a user to 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 uh, before they present to a uh, to the executives to understand the risk profile around their forecast but we're on the one hand um, and then on the other hand if you uh, are in the boardroom you can actually look at a specific um, combinations of different scenarios so you could you know in this here this is a macro model for thinking about non-performing loans but you could do the same thing in the banking context if you were thinking about a stress test and you wanted to look at um, how non-performing loans would go up um, and say so here you know you've the upper gap is, is a measure of of excess or or um, or excess capacity and so you know you could think of a really bad recession and you could input that you could input you know a really bad inflationary spike and a, and a worsening in financial conditions. And then, so you have a complex combination of different shocks, and then you can assess, you can generate the forecast. So on the one hand, it gives you a point forecast, but then what's, what's incredible if you layer probabilistic forecasting on top of that is you can then assess how realistic is that combination um, of, of shocks that you put in. So how does, what does the data say about whether this combination that you're putting in as a scenario is realistic or not. And from a financial uh, regulatory perspective, you know, a lot of focus in banking is on those, you know, not those fifth percentile um, risks, those those tail risks um, and being able to understand, understand them and and express how likely um, a really adverse shock is. Rousseau, do you have anything to add on that? Did I, did I get that? Uh, right? Yeah, I basically think that is a good summary. I mean, just maybe to give an example to what uh, you mentioned, if you're in the trading game, if you are, say, um, looking at uh, performance of various stocks uh, and you are in a boardroom, like Don said, you can actually s create scenarios or around which um, returns each one of them will hit and you can create as many scenarios as you want and you'd be able to attach probabilities to every single one of those scenarios so you can in some way actually identify which of the scenarios that you are setting out um, is most likely and yeah if i can just add one more thing also to the idea of tracking um, model judgments is just that it also keeps everybody um, accountable because if you're attaching the appropriate metadata to it and um, you're actually keeping track of who put which judgments in the model at which stages, um, once you go back and assess that, you know, you can actually see where the movements in the model came from and uh, who really drove uh, the outcomes that, that, the model, that the model had. 
And I'd like to add to that, that it's, this isn't necessarily just criticism. Often model judgments are incredibly important to be able to tell a coherent story. So because sometimes models don't do a great job of describing um, the current context uh, or you want, in the case of a structural model in economics, you want to be able to, uh, because you have a structural model where um, the nature of the, the judgment um, will, if, will you have to be able to say what kind of judgments it is. So it is, for example, it's a supply shock that that will lead to inflation. That is uh, that is a judgment that the that the executive themselves may want to impose on the model. So they want to say, going forward, the supply constraints are going to remain a problem, right? And you that's something that the the model because it hasn't seen supply constraints of the type we're experiencing at the moment won't tell you is in the data. So very often the judgments, it goes the other way as well. You really want good judgments to be applied. Thanks, Don. I, I, uh, there were two questions. Uh, Renita, Renita had her hand up and she put it down. I'm, I'm hoping that you answered the question. Um, Renita, is that correct? Did, did you receive an answer or is there another question? Yeah, I there? think that, thanks, thanks. Uh, I think in the latter part of the discussion, they've answered the question in terms of judgments that it could go either way. You could, right. you could determine the narrative based on how you want it to go, uh, which is very dangerous in many, many respects. Uh, you could also, you know, um, and, and I think Dan spoke to it now towards the end, it could go either way depending on what uh, you you model for for your judgments um so even though the platform integrates and uh, provides maybe a more um, seamless flow of the data i don't think it necessarily solves the problem uh for forecasting i think the age-old tradition of forecasting using uh, human judgment still is pretty much uh, par for the course. Exactly, but I think to add to that, that you actually empower decision makers around a boardroom where you either have, um, you know, a single decision maker or you, if it's a it's by cons the decision has to be made by consensus, you enable them to sit around and make a decision about whether the judgments that are being imposed are appropriate and then um, they're able to actually have a forecast that represents either the, the single decision maker's perspective or the view of the group. Now, there are some applications where that's very useful, um, but as you say, um, you are, this, this could make a forecast better or worse, but importantly, uh, as we showed in the previous uh, seminar, what you really want to do as a data scientist is always be assessing how good the the results, the forecasts from the models are. And if you have that information combined with uh, the ability to add judgment, you know, you that that really helps um, to, that puts all of the, the power in the hands of either the analyst or the decision maker. Thanks, Don. Um, I, I need to dash, but I, I just I know there are two questions, one from Rob, which was uh, I always like Rob's question. His, his question is something. Um, what are the let me go back to this. Um, Rob's question was, what are the typical questions you 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 find you have to answer from skeptical business execs? So that, that was one of Rob's questions. That's helpful. And then Don has some. I mean, JG has some questions around harmonization, but I'd like to just leave you. I know Paul, uh, Paul will close out the session, but Don, just to say thanks to everybody. And guys, I hope you have a wonderful night and we will see you around. Thanks very much. Cheers, everybody. Thanks a lot, Howard. Thanks, a lot, Howard. Thanks, Howard. Thank you. Well, Byron, I've, I've done a lot of talking. Byron or so, do you have any, um, do you have, can you think of what some of the hardest questions are that we've been up? been asked to answer? Well, I mean, you we have, uh, you know, when we were working in the, in the central banking context, you get sort of a standard uh, set of questions and none of them are, are easy to answer. Um, but, uh, you know, the the advantage of having models is, uh, is allowing you to give a consistent uh, uh, narrative, right? Um, 
But yeah, any questions that have to do with the uh, structural um, outlook of the economy are, are, are of course always difficult to answer. Um, and, and being able to rely on models um, ensures that you give um, answers. Well, not it's not necessary that um, the future will turn out the way that you think it will, but that you give um, you know answers that are consistent with the uh, with the theory of economics and um, uh, and what we know about the world um, does give you some level of of confidence in 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 the advice that you're giving to executives. So so yeah, basically uh, being able to have these models um, at hand. Um, yeah, is, is a major advantage um, in, in that uh, situation. Yeah, I think uh, one of the most tricky ones to always defend is uh, why use a model at all? And why not should an analyst not just use his gut feel um, and what he perceives uh, the direction of something's going to be? And uh, my answer to that is always just, uh, I think that you know, the world we live in is quite complex. And what a model really does is it provides you with thought discipline and a consistent way to think through the problem um, and a consistent approach that you can actually reevaluate uh, as you go along. And it is it allows you the ability to iteratively uh, improve uh, on your approach and on your on your forecast, where if you're just picking numbers haphazardly, it's very difficult to to then uh, ex post go back and understand why you got things wrong. Um, or if you really keeping track of the judgments that you're making, if you're keeping track of the model's performance, uh, relationships between variables, it does allow you to actually uh, improve uh, your forecasts or um, modeling over time. So I'm unable to see the screen or hands or questions. So if someone else could uh, uh, could share this so that I could uh, so I know what questions to answer. I'm keeping it yes, tabs on, sir. <laughs> uh, JG asked uh, whether we could give some detail regarding the gains of harmonization as referenced under metadata from your. DVR roadmap. So uh, sorry, Did you, maybe you, you're in a good position to answer that one. Yeah, um, uh, I don't know if you can go to the DVR roadmap. I'm not exactly to which that refers. Okay. Um, was it this one or was it this one? I don't know, so maybe I'll just give context to the questions. The next one. Okay. And, and in particular, I was going back, but I um, feel like uh, table, yeah. No, one more. Oh. Uh, wrong way. Yeah. It, it was interesting in terms of the use case for data value realization had metadata as a gain. Um, and I would just really like to find out how did how did that process of harmonization happen? And in particular, uh, I'm finding quite a challenge harmonizing relatively disparate frameworks. And I was wondering if you have found a way through that. Thanks, Don. Byron. What's or, or been, Byron? <laughs> uh, I think that's one with Byron. He's been the one that's, you know, done. Uh, he's been the one struggling through this. Yeah, well, um, it is it is a very difficult uh, problem to solve, I think. Um, and I, I don't know that we've fully solved it, but uh, our approach to it has been to to centralize the metadata um, in the in the STMX registry, and therefore or thereby create a, a sort of a ground truth for. Um, interpreting the the underlying data right um, I guess the the challenge there is to get everybody to buy into your uh, your ground truth um, um, about the data um, but if everyone is willing to buy into the system then um, 
then the infrastructure allows you to very easily um, distribute that uh, that that um, understanding of the data between the different uh, stakeholders. Um, so if everybody's using, if everybody's working within the SDMX model, um, then uh, you know. Uh, Syncing these environments, metadata environments, is, um, is 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 trivial by the by the construction of the technology. Um, no, getting sorry. that buy-in, I think, is yeah. is the difficult part. Well, thanks, Brian. That uh, cool. That gives the context. So it's 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 relative to the registry, and the registry is aligned on the SDMX um, framework, and therefore, if everybody agrees to that, you've got it. And if anybody doesn't, well, then um, uh, you know, initiate a harmonization discussion. Um, cool. Thank yeah, you. yeah. So you, you, the, the, the registry you. allows to uh, allows for mapping between uh, different structures. So you could map between, an, uh, you know, uh, somebody else's understanding and your understanding. But I think you know, getting that um, um, that centralized ground truth as a as, you know people to buy into that. I think that's the tricky bit. Anyways, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Byron. I have, a, I have a question almost on the SDMX guidelines. Do they do they give guidance, for example, to say all data has to be tidy, meaning like in one row you can only have one piece of data, you can't have Co multiple columns with multiple years or things like that or does the SDMX not really specify things like that? No, it definitely does. So there's uh, the SDMX data format, uh, which is in, um, there, there are a number of different versions of it. Um, so like there's one for XML, there's one for JSON, there's one for CSV. Um, so depending on which data format you're using, there's definitely a um, a completely described way of setting out the data uh, in each of those um, uh, message formats. It, it's actually very, very strict because you need to be able to um, validate the data um, and uh, for, uh, for a machine to be able to validate the data, it needs to follow. Uh, fairly precise rules. Cool, thanks. Are there any other questions? If not, um, thanks a lot for um, for attending and um, for the opportunity to present uh, to you. Um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a, a a great opportunity and it's been use really useful to apply Howard's frameworks to our use cases. So. Um, and hopefully it's been um, you know enlightening to others as well. I'd really be appreciate any feedback or suggestions as well. Fantastic, Don. Thank you. Thanks everybody for your contributions and preparation for for the whole series. Uh, just a reminder: just reach out to us on LinkedIn, and Debbie will get us uh, send copies of the recordings. And um, I think just. You know, um, reformat getting the, the the slide deck ready for distribution as well. If anybody is keen to to go through it again, so um, and as Don said, drop any questions either to us at, on LinkedIn or or to Howard or Don directly. Obviously, it's I'm sure he's accessible there too. So, thanks again, guys, and uh, look forward to seeing you all next time. Have a great evening. Thank great. you all. Thanks, Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.